So welcome to the Yorkshire Sound Women Network's Level Up in Audio Seminar Series. Um, I'm Jess and I'm pleased to be back again hosting the fourth event with our guests. Uh, event is musical artists and audio professionals presenting their inspirational projects. Please re refrain from taking any screenshots or recordings of the session um, because we are recording it and we will send it to you at a later date. So um, that will get to you. Uh, if you wish to remain anonymous in the call, feel free to turn your camera off. That's absolutely fine. Um, and just a reminder to go on mute unless you're asking a question, that'd be great. Um, speaking of questions, we encourage and love questions. So if you have any questions throughout, um, I advise that you write them in the chat section so you don't forget them um, and we will revisit them when uh, it's an appropriate time. Um, and also alternative when we open up for questions um, we'll have little sections throughout so please feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions away. Um, the structure of the session um, is going to be um, in chunks so Sarah is going to tell us a little bit about herself a little intro and then we'll have a, a chance for any questions there and then she's going to um, tell us about her background and all of her inspirations um, and then give us some examples of her work so um, I think well, I'm sure she'll tell you, but I think she wants to encourage more of a, a question throughout um, type of vibe. So please feel free to chip in with any questions. Um, that'd be great. So um, I'm really excited to present uh, Sarah today. Um, she's a composer for film, theatre um, and concert. She's a performer and electronic artist and robotics artist. Um, the outcome of Sarah's work is unique and inventive. Um, due to her wide range of interests and backgrounds that we're gonna hear about. Um, Sarah studied classical music. She specialized in Baroque and Renaissance music, and then she became involved in the folk music scene. Um, alongside this, uh, she's also studied electroacoustics, sound design and robotics. Um, so as you can imagine, the interactions of all these different fields allow for the fusion of electronics meets orchestral and ancient instruments, uh, as well as folk songs um, and robotics as well. Um, so Sarah's interests lie in the exploration of folklore, as I said, both past and present. The meeting point, is that Sarah? Oh, oh great, hi Sarah. Um, sorry. Um, uh, so yeah, what was I saying? She speaks about the, the blurring the boundaries of composition and sound design, combining uh, instrumental composition with um, electronic and algorithmic techniques. Um, she's created two albums, The Ealing Feeder in 2017, which is inspired by London's past and present folklore, and Heirloom in 2019, exploring ancient instruments and electroacoustic techniques. Um, she's also done numerous scoring for film, theatre and live performance. Um, and her work is, is thought provoking and inventive, um, and I'm really, really excited to hear from her today. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to hand over um, and I'm really excited, all the things you've got in the background there, Sarah. So I'm gonna hand over to you. Hello. Um, <laughs> can you all hear me first of all? Because um, obviously you're on Zoom. Yes, right, great. Well, lovely to be here. A little bit strange being on Zoom. So um, I hope all this works. Um, yeah, so I've been asked to talk about my background and my practice and how that relates to technology and sound and how and why I do the things I do. So um, what I thought I'd do is a, just a very brief intro about the sorts of things I'm doing right now, then tell you about my background, then give some examples of stuff that I do that sort of stems from that. And if you have any questions on the way, do say, um, I don't know whether you're waving rather than being on mute, but Jess, could you sort of just make a sound so I catch, yes. And um, so if I'm going off on a tangent that's not of interest, just say, because um, I'm sort of, I can't see you all, so I'm guessing. Um, also, just to apologise, I am actually recovering from a certain virus at the moment. So if I'm a little bit um, all over the place, that's why. So that's my excuses out of the way. Right. So um, obviously at the moment, we're all completely up in the air. But um, were it not for COVID and pre-COVID, the sort of typical month for me would be, um, like many of us, seeking out opportunities to perform my own music live and in the background writing my own music. And by writing, that tends to sort of mean everything. It means sort of uh, old-fashioned notated stuff like that. 
that's something that I'm writing at the moment. And it also means um, working with tools like Ableton, but particularly for me, Max MSP. I'm sure many, many of you are familiar with Max, but for those of you who aren't, Max is software, a very similar thing to Pure Data, which is an open source version of the same. Max is software that allows me to sort of graphically program sound. So like in the old days, you had to have a really, really expensive studio with loads and loads of units of this, that and the other on the shelf. It's as though my units, so I can have like filters and adders and delay machines and all of that. It's like those, those units are little physical boxes I can draw on the screen, little virtual boxes I can draw on the screen. So it's like I've got a virtual studio and I can wire things together in whatever way I fancy to create my own effects. And I use that because I have ideas in my head that the off the peg stuff doesn't do. And I do use the off the peg stuff. I use reverb, I use delay, I use compression, all of that stuff. But I actually tend to want to do really pared down, but very, very particular things with my sound. And it's coming because I've got a target in my head. And that's why I've gone down the Max MSP route. And later on, if anybody wants to have sort of more in-depth discussion about Max, I'm very happy to do so. Um, so yeah, so that's me sort of, my sort of, if you like, following my heart as an electronic musician and an experimental musician. The other thing I do to follow my heart is I build my own instruments. And anybody that's seen me might have seen, well, I'll give you an example. So this is something very early. I wouldn't really call this a build. <laughs> I wouldn't really call this a build, more of a mod. So um, my sort of early work with robotics was with this fella here. You will see him later on. That's Hugo. Hugo, um, he's a 1930s ventriloquist dummy that I roboticized. And he sort of dis just disembodied just the head. And I, I started using him just because um, I was at a, I, I know I sort of hang out with, well, I used to hang out with magicians quite a lot. And I got invited to a magic circle bazaar and this was there. And a bloke said, oh, uh, this has been in somebody's a dead magician's attic. He took it out once and it scared everybody. And it hasn't been out since the 50s. So I obviously bought it. And then I roboticized him and he became a sort of um, a way to sort of like an alter ego on stage where when I was performing, because I perform various instruments and obviously my brain's occupied and my hands are occupied performing if I'm playing a keyboard or theremin or saw or record or whatever. And I was trying to find ways to sort of have voices on the stage when I was performing solo. And I thought, well, if I get a robot voice and it, and it comes with its own sort of almost like story that you can't escape when you see it, which is what happens when you see a creature like Hugo, a thing like Hugo, um, then, that, then that's that sort of rich pickings. And I found out that it was, and he became my sort of alter ego. And he, he would say quite adventurous things on stage that I wouldn't really want to say myself. And, and I quite like the, there was an interesting dynamic. I mean, it's literally like the stereotype. There was a very interesting dynamic between me and Hugo on the stage. But then I kind of started to feel that, because Hugo came into my life, it sounds like it's a relationship, which it is. Hugo came into my sort of working life when I was first getting into performing live. And I, I'm going to talk about how that happened. And it wasn't, you know, a place like Cafe Oto or Supersonic Festival. It was actually at sort of burlesque nights, believe it or not. And he kind of really fitted there. And the whole ethos of that sort of, sort of queer burlesque scene, really, which I can talk about a little bit. And I learned an awful, awful lot about performance and the sort of structuring of a performance from watching really, really good magicians and performers of all types. And I can talk about that later. Um, so yes, so I, and, and, then, and then I sort of moved off from the sort of more figurative stuff and just started thinking, having the confidence in what I was doing and focusing more on machines that were just there to make sound for their own sake. And one of those is the Ealing Feeder. I don't have the Ealing Feeder here with me today because I can't, because I can't squeeze it in. But in a minute, I'll show you a video of it. It's also um, in a bit of a sorry state because my very last gig was in Portugal and it got dropped at the airport. So it's, as soon as we're out of lockdown, it's the first thing I'm going to fix. The Ealing Feeder is a carillon that I built 
that can perform riffs really, really fast. So a carol on is polyphonic bells, right? This is going to be the first test of Zoom. Let me see if I can get a photo of the... I know, I'll actually watch, I'll play a video of the Ealing Theatre. Hang on. I'll show a photo. Hang on. Uh, first test of my Zoom skills coming up. <laughs> right, so I'm going to share the screen. Can you all see that? Yeah. So this is it. It's this is um, so basically it's 28 bells. This is with a bright light on it. It looks much more lovely and sort of subdued light. And they play really, really fast. And what that was about was, again, I was writing stuff. I was sort of into sort of generative work, sort of creating sort of self-fulfilling, self-playing music. But because of my background, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, I found myself in, say, about 2003, 2004, going out playing what I'd call a laptop gig and it completely leaving me cold and the audience cold. And I thought, well, this is interesting because I've done something very important for me is that I've liberated myself from the deficiencies of my body and hands. I can only play so fast. Um, yet I've ended up with music that is a complete bum freezer. Nobody wants to listen to it. And so I started to think, well, can I sort of do what the computer is good at? which is playing sort of inhumanly fast things, but give it a sort of physical instantiation. And so that's what I did with the Ealing Feeder. I built this thing, thought, well, what would it be like, just as an experiment, to build a machine that can play for me, but is physically in the room. And yeah, and it was definitely, definitely um, the right direction. And I've sort of been moving on further in that way ever since. Um, I wonder if I can do it. Um, actually, can you do it, Jess, so that I don't keep jumping around? If you just play a little bit of, say, um, Camwell Beauty. So Camwell Beauty is a sort of upbeat thing I do in the middle of my quite doomy set. Um, I, I live near Camberwell. And um, Camwell Beauty, you can hear the Ealing feeder at work with, a, with um, a spinet. And you can just hear how fast it moves. And if you go to the end, actually, Jess, like the last, say, the last minute of it, actually, that's Camwell Beauty. You can hear it do what I call a double, where I, I sort of play a tune and then I get it to throw in another note on the half beat that's a particular interval above it. And, and it just literally just creates a sort of haze of metal. And I'm sort of into that idea, like I wouldn't have been able to compose that, but a lot of machines sort of co-composed it with me. Can you play that? Is that all right, Jess? Um, yes, I'm just... I don't have, I send have, you? The, have, I I don't have you? the share screen um, music. Oh, do I need to? Do I need no. to... Um, I well, should I just do it? I should I'll just do it, actually, because uh, I was trying to be slick. <laughs> and it was actually less slick. OK, this is going to be interesting. Right, OK. Right, share screen. I've set up a little. This, incidentally, if anybody's unfamiliar with it, this is me making what's known as a QLab file. Uh, QLab is what I use in theatre. I've just done it here. Right. So here it is. It's a sort of very sort of, I wouldn't say anodyne, but it's a sort of joyful piece about how I feel about Camberwell, actually. Is that better? to the end so you can hear what I mean by the double so you hear the double you can sit you can probably see it on that waveform the double kicking in so on 
So yes, yeah, so that ceiling feeder, by the way, can you hear me while I'm sharing? Yes, great. So that ceiling feeder and actually the bells have been used in sort of le less sort of, uh, so this is like needle that I've used in a film recently, same sort of idea. But um, because I've now got these machines, then I find that I'm open to um, sort of uh, collaborations with the sort of unlikely sort of scenarios. So there's a wonderful one about four years ago. I'm not going to spend time looking at it, but you can look at it later on Vimeo um, in Stave Hill Ecology Park, um, where we took the carillon and because it can play automatically, uh, there's a, an acoustic, bioacoustic, bioacoustician um dan stowell and to count species he's been making um machine learning algorithms that um can identify and count birds i need to look over there don't know I'm, I'm sort of looking in the wrong direction that i that can identify and count birds from um a sound source so basically you stick a microphone up in the air during the dawn chorus and it goes all oh, this, you know, four sparrows and three woodlarks or whatever. That's the sort of goal. That is a very, very hard problem in acoustics, but that's what they're working towards. But basically what it means is part of the step, stepping stone to do this is that he's transcribing bird song into frequencies. So he can have these really, really, really long pages upon pages and pages every sort of hundredth of a second of what the frequency of a particular um, bird is singing. And they're all sort of untangled from one another. And um, so he said, would I be interested in this? Which, of course, I was. So um, together, we took his frequencies and um, I sort of made a max patch. We took the frequencies and then sort of did a bit of jiggery pokery and then threw them out as approximate MIDI pitches onto the carillon. And so we could have the carillon playing the dawn chorus. And it was a very strange thing because it felt sort of birdy, but it felt mechanical all at the same time. And I love that sort of ambiguous sort of grey zone between the two. And then interestingly, on a recent album, I'll play this as it might be of interest. I um, thought, well, I was being quite literal again. I always try not to be too literal about these things. Uh, I was putting bird song in these sort of birdie registers. And I thought, well, you don't really hear sort of butch bird song very often. And I thought, wouldn't it be quite interesting to hear bird song or something sort of really meaty, like an old harmonium. So on my um, current album, there's a track called Egg and it's taking the same data and it's throwing it out onto a harmonium. Um, and um, yeah, so it was quite interesting. So this is bird song from a dawn chorus in Estonia, automatically transcribed. And then I've taken some of my favorite bits and put them out on a harmonium. This is egg. No, you can listen to that one if you're interested another time. So, um, I, uh, what am I trying to say? So it might sort of seem all sort of odd, all these sort of connections, but um, everything I'm saying about Hugo, everything I'm saying about the bells, everything I'm saying about that uh, little adventure in sort of bird song with Dan Stowell, to me, they all have a family resemblance. And the sort of, um, the unifying factor is my sort of interest in human things that feel machine-like and machine things that feel human-like. And, and that's not an accident, really. That comes from my background in robotics, particularly biologically inspired robotics. And I think this is a good juncture now to tell you a little bit about my background because it is a bit of an odd one and it's a bit of a sort of funny old road that I took to becoming a sort of live musician. And I should say, I've got to add that that's my sort of following my heart doing that sort of stuff but my bread and butter work which i also love doing by the way is sort of uh large-scale theater pieces where i'm a composer sound designer 
and more recently film scores. And I mean, I've just done a horror film score, which was literally my idea of like, as practically everybody I know who works in electronic music, like died and gone to heaven writing a horror film score. Unfortunately, though, it's been a bit of a sad old time because um, it was selected. It was it was a, a film called Amulet, written and directed by Romola Garay. It was selected for um, Sundance in January 2020. And they thought, hey, and then lockdown happened and it has disappeared into the COVID vortex. So some people in America have seen it. Nobody in the UK has seen it. I can't share clips from it. I can't share news from it. I'm hearing about lots of my other composer friends uh, doing horror scores. I don't want to go, yeah, and listen to this. And I can't, it's like locked away. However, I think because we can snip stuff out, I can actually play you a few bits today because um, it sort of might be of interest about the sort of approach. And it's actually just quite interesting to hear what people are up to, I suppose. So um, I was going to say a bit about my background, but before I do that, has anybody got any immediate burning questions or comments? We do have one question in the chat um, from yeah. Joe. Um, how do you tune a carillon, if that's how you spell it? A carillon? Well, you don't tune it, actually. What's interesting is that uh, you get your bells. So I should have mentioned, yes, though, the bells are um, just some little Hungarian, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the word, uh, school sort of bell set. And they're wonderful because, because they're Hungarian, they're not in equally tempered scale. So they're not like the sort of Western musical scale. They've got interesting sort of stretched intervals. So they have a sort of slight sort of um, angularity in the sort of uh, harmonic structure, like the way they sound that you just don't get if you... We're using a sample where it was all sort of tuned to a Western, temp, you know, equally tempered scale. So they sort of come as is. And actually, the next thing I'm actually working on at the moment is moving away from as is and trying to make my own stuff. And I'm working now with 3D printing. And one of so, so sort of step one of 3D printing, which I'm going to go on to later, but I'm like, is it there? I'll try and get it. Hang on a sec. So yeah, so step one of 3D printing is taking machines like this. So this is an organet disc because it's played on a little sort of automatic organ. And I'm trying to write software that will go for music into build, you know, making a, a design for a 3D print so I can sort of write my own tunes on those old machines. And so that's like a sort of stepping stone, but ultimately I want to be making my own pipes and things by sort of 3D printing. Because yeah, they're, those come as they are. And actually bells are really, really difficult to tune and they tend to go out of shape and tend to be a bit of knocking around. And it's not about just tuning the bells, like really, these are both sort of cheapo bells, but like I have some really beautiful Whitechapel bells here, which I managed to procure from somebody. And those are beautiful, beautiful bells. And that's all about all the harmonics and how they sort of very finely sort of affect the envelope of the bell, the shape of the bell to make different harmonics sing, things like the quint and things like that. And, and yeah, it's a real art. And of course, it's going to be a lost art because the bell foundry in Whitechapel, which has been running since Elizabethan times, is about to close and be turned into a boutique hotel. If there's one good thing about COVID, it will be if that project fails <laughs> and the museum stays where it is. Okay, right. So um, I don't know whether that was helpful, but yes, you can't really tune it. You get it as it is. And it's exciting because it um, has this sort of angularity of tuning. It's a mean tone scale or something. And then I, with it, I play, um, that was a bit of a plastic sounding, um, spin it but with it these days you'll see me out with a little instrument called a clavis in Barlam, which i haven't got room to show you but it's over there so at the end i might just sort of hold it up and show you it it's a sort of lithuan um latvian instrument where well, they come from all over the world but mine's from latvia and um it's like a precursor of the harpsichord it's like the first time people took instruments like the santur or the uh psaltery and started to put keys on them and it, it sound it, it does sound like um could come from anywhere in the world it's like this very very long ringing tone but it's got keys that you can just about play so i went off on a tangent there um so should i talk a little bit about my background yeah yeah 
Um, so first thing to say, you probably notice I'm quite long in the tooth. I'm Generation X, or as I like to call myself now, Generation V, as I had the vaccine yes, uh, earlier this week. Um, and uh, I am. it took quite a long while to get to be performing live. And that is because of my quite unusual route to getting there. Um, very, very, this is like a very brief summary, is that um, I don't come from the sort of family where there's sort of pianos and things like that around, but I do come from a family that on my mother's side is Welsh. And anybody that's sort of got that sort of traditional South Wales sort of influence in their family, that heritage, knows that just singing communally and just singing and making music for its own sake and for the joy of it is just sort of part of family life. I mean, literally, you know, I, it's, we would have family parties and everybody would sing and everybody would know all the songs and everybody would do a party piece. So it was sort of the most natural thing in the world for me to sing and make music, but it was never sort of formal. And I was the odd one in the family because I was the first one to get really into it as a sort of formal thing through this county music programme and things like that. And I lived in Watford and we had a fantastic children's choir in Watford. So when I was, you know, at junior school, I just, it's like joining the Finchley Children's Choir, joining this particular choir in Watford. I just got lucky. I got in this choir. There was a woman called Anne Bright, this is in the 70s, <laughs> who ran it. And um, she taught us all solfege. So we learned to sing through solfege, like not notes on a page. We literally learned do, so, do, and all of this and what's known as the Kodaya method. So like just ordinary kids from Watford, not public school kids, just ordinary state school kids from Watford, learning these amazing ways to do music. So we kind of understood music in our bones, even though we couldn't necessarily even read it at that stage. And also it meant that because she was teaching us Kodaya method, she was giving us like bits of Bartok and things like that. And um, uh, sort of Jewish folk songs, all sorts of wonderful, wonderful sorts of Shafardic, all this sort of stuff. We were doing amazing music and it was just sort of just seemed like the most natural thing in the world to go from a sort of Shafardic song to an English folk song to, you know, do any facility do and all this. And so I just got lucky that I was in this choir and it gave me a grounding in music that I am forever thankful to Anne Bright for. Then I got really good at music, but I didn't really. Um, yeah, well, I sort of got really good at music at school. And then we moved to Bedfordshire and Bedfordshire had, a, as I say, a really good county music programme. And one of the things they did was that if you were showing interest and promise in music, they packed you off on a Saturday morning. I mean, this is unbelievable, for free to the music colleges on a Saturday morning as what they called a junior exhibitioner. I don't know whether that still exists as a free thing or not, but it did in my day. And uh, I went there ostensibly to get better at my instruments. And it was a bit odd because I have to say, partly because of my background, because we didn't have sort of clarinets and things lying about, the instrument that I had got really, really hot at was the recorder, and I was playing Baroque and Renaissance music, and I was really into that sort of culture, a sort of, you know, a sort of very geeky sort of, you know, 12, 13-year-old. And, um, but it was actually, when I got there, that it was the composition element and the extemporization element that just blew me away, and I was like a duck to water, and I absolutely loved it. So I did that for quite a few years, and um, also played the piano and all of that. And then um, and a bit of violin and all of that, but never, never as well as I played the recorder, but it was the composition that really got to me. And then everybody assumed that um, I would sort of be the sort of person who'd then go to music college and that would be me. But a few sort of strange things happened. So first of all, um, when I was 13, I became very, very ill. I had a quite a serious illness that sort of took me out of school for a bit, it was sort of, related to sort of septicemia, just a nasty thing that happened when I was a kid. And also, um, ever since I had been a kid, I'd been mucking about with sort of tape recorders and, you know, that was all there was really, because it was before the digital sort of time when everybody had a laptop, sort of mucking about with tape recorders and cassettes and things like that. And making my own sort of cassette sort of fantasies is what I'd call them about like slowing down records and all of that and sort of making sort of things about trips to the moon and all of that. And um, so I kind of always had this inkling that I just absolutely got obsessed with like certain bits of records. Like, you know, I can remember an old Bowie track and I was obsessed with the last 20 seconds of it and the way that it sort of faded out and things like that. 
and um and i had this sort of chance encounter in the middle of all this sort of maelstrom that was going on in my life to do with i was actually really really feverish for about a year because i had uh like sepsis you know um i i heard this thing from the b what was that? i didn't know at the time was the bbc radiophonic workshop and it was malcolm clark's adaptation of and there will come soft rains a bradbury thing and it completely blew me away and i just became obsessed with trying to find a way to make electronic music and like there was just if you were like a kid where i was there was no way in that day to make electronic music and to cut a very very long story short i worked out that what i needed to do was get into a studio and also that nobody was going to let me into the studio because you know this was the mid 80s i was female i wasn't well connected i wasn't middle class i didn't have any of the cachet that i needed so i thought i need to make myself sort of bulletproof i need to make myself so good that they can't possibly not let me into the radiophonic workshop or whatever it would be so i decided to go and study um electroacoustic engineering so i went off to college and did an engineering degree totally <laughs> total swerve and it was like real proper hardcore like maths engineering um electro you know acoustics design of transducers uh, building acoustics, noise control, uh, human acoustics, you know, it's just like all that sort of stuff up at Salford. And, um, but very, very little music, but I sort of carried on with my music on the side and carried on doing a lot of politics on the side as well. O only woman on this course. I mean, I was like a complete sort of outsider on the whole thing, but it was a really good course. And then I got to the end of it, and uh, this, is, this sounds like a sob story, but it's actually a story of triumph over adversity. I got to the end of it and um, I've been writing music for all the college plays and things like that while I was there and writing my own stuff and going off to Dartington on a bursary in the holidays to do composition. And I thought, great, I'm this amazingly, you know, I know all this stuff about, you know, I know every Bull and Kerr equipment there is. I know everything there is about acoustics and all this and I can write music. They're going to really want me, aren't they? So I, I went to the obvious place and I'm going to name and shame. It was uh, City University. I knocked on the door, I, you know, literally, figuratively speaking, I was in a phone box at the time. I rang up the professor, who I will not name and shame, and I said, well, I, I write music. I've been into electronic music since I was a kid. I've done this because I wanted to do it. Uh, I'd love to do a, like a master's or a PhD. What do I do? And he basically said, well, we've never heard of you. Where have you studied? Oh, we've never heard of that. No, we couldn't possibly take you. And that was it. And I was just sort of thrown into the wilderness. And I just thought, oh, Oh, so, um, and I was skint because I'd just finished my degree and I didn't have any money. And so I kind of gave up on that and I went and took the first job I could find, which was actually a really nice job working with a building engineering company. And this was the time when all lots of very interesting concert halls were going up, things like the big uh, Birmingham Symphony Hall, but it was all the sort of big companies that were getting those jobs and people like me were getting things like acoustics of school rooms and <laughs> noise control of pipes from air handling units so it was all a bit of a bore really and uh and then and then the crash happened the first of many crashes uh in the early 90s and I lost my job and then I sort of drifted for a bit did a bit of sort of volunteering and then ended up working in the science museum which was great because I got very, very back into sort of history of technology, which I found fascinating. And then I left that, worked in multimedia when multimedia was like a shiny thing that you could buy, you know, not just the internet. And then uh, gradually, gradually clawed my way back into music. And I did it through a sort of really circuitous route. First of all, sort of doing sort of cabaret nights and things like that, but sort of going out, <laughs> I can't believe, like going out with my theremin at sort of, places like the Double R Club and things like that, which was this sort of big cabaret, sort of queer cabaret scene in sort of uh, uh, East London and, and the equivalent in Brighton, and slowly, slowly clawing my way back. And um, the other thing I did all that time was I, I was very into folk music and I used to sort of perform at folk clubs. And so um, it was a really circuitous route. But what that meant was that um, I had this really, really weird skill set. By the time I was back up and running again as a musician, First of all, the liberating thing was that the laptop era was well and truly here. And so this professor might still not invite me in. Actually, I've got a really joyful story about that. I met him about a month, about six, six or 
six months before COVID, I was doing an event and he came up to me and he said, who are you? Why have I not heard of you before? Where are you? What are you doing? And all this. And I just said to him really coldly, I said, well, I'm a full-time composer. And he said, that's really hard, isn't it? I said, nah. <laughs> so I said, you know, I make it work. And uh, yeah, he's still at large, this person. And I wonder how many other doors he's closed in people's faces. But anyway, but um, but yes, yeah, so, so I sort of made my own way there. And, you know, and of course the electronic music scene now, because you can do whatever you want at home, is very much a sort of a DIY scene. Um, I, I can sort of joyfully do whatever I want. I can make stuff virtually. I can make machines. If I can carry the stuff to a venue, one way or another, I can sort of perform under my own steam. And that's what I do. And and then all my sort of museum background and that sort of training in electroacoustics, which I followed up with robotics because I got very interested in the sort of interface between human and machines. It all sort of feeds in and it might all sound a bit random, but I thought what would be quite interesting is to show you a couple of examples of how it all sort of feeds together. Would that be of interest? Has anybody got any questions before I do that? <laughs> is this all completely random? Is there anything? Like, it's very hard on Zoom to know whether it's like talking to a fish tank because you can't see anything. You're just sort of seeing a sort of big blur. Can, um, I'm not saying you look like fish. What I'm saying is my screen looks like a fish tank at the moment. I've got so much on it. Um, any questions before I go on? Yes. I mean, I think this is all like super interesting and, you know, really engaging to hear. So if, if no one, yep, keep going. Okay, keep going. Okay, yeah. right, yeah. Okay, so I here's an example. Going. Here's an example of how I'm using, because um, I could talk to you ages about how I use Macs and all the nitty gritty of that, but you get plenty of people to do that. And actually I'd be really happy to come on and do a tutorial on Mac if anyone's interested. But here's an example of my sort of thinking, a couple. So here is one from the submarine world <laughs> to the album and theatre world. So this is that sort of thing, just sort of like um, eclectic thinking, really. Share screen. OK, right. So I'm sharing the wrong thing. Share screen. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Can you see that video? Yeah. Is that showing a video? No. It's not, is it? It is. Can you hear it if I play it? Yeah. Okay. So what this is, I'll turn it very low volume. I'll turn the volume off for a bit while it's going. So the volume's down then. Is um, because I've got this museum background, um, one of the ways that I can earn a bit of money. Is, is sort of doing what I call sort of reanimating sites. So this is an example. This is an absolutely astounding thing. It's the UK's last surviving World War II era submarine in Gosport. But when I was brought on board, none of the equipment worked. And so it was a bit of a dead experience. And so they asked me to, actually what they asked me to do, funny enough, was make an audio guide. And I hate with an absolute passion audio guides because, um, they kind of put people in this bubble where they can't talk to one another and they don't sort of sense the acoustics of the space. And, and they're always ghastly as well, aren't they? They're very sort of didactic. And I thought, no, I want people to be able to sort of explore the space as it is. And then they said, well, yeah, but there'll be this really annoying thing with bleed, as in people at one end of the submarine and they'll hear the stuff from the other end. And I said, well, what we're gonna do is we're going to make it like the real submarine where there would have been bleed, where, of course, when you're in the mess room, you heard the engine room, you know, because that's what submarines do. And so what I did was I used Max to create, um, we put 60 speakers. So I managed to persuade them not to spend their money on this horrible, horrible audio guide. Um, instead, put 60 speakers around there and run enormous Max MSP patch. And then I worked in my sort of museum way with... Um, veteran submariners and it was actually really moving because these men are in their 80s and they know that they are not long for this earth and they've got this sort of sonic memory of the submarine age that's going with them it's going to be gone when they're gone and submariners are the best listeners because if you think about it you're in a steel box in the middle of somewhere like the Bering Strait playing cat and mouse with the Soviets during the Cold War and all you would do and this was basically what the balance of, I mean, it's horrible. This is what the balance of terror 
was based on. It, it was like some bloke in a submarine listening through the wall of the submarine for little scratches for some bloke in another submarine on, in the Bering Strait. And they used to have this long period, incidentally, called um, quiet running, where they thought that the Soviets had spotted a NATO submarine. And these men would literally spend days upon days in absolute silence, not even being able to move, move a fork in a drawer. I mean, I could not believe the stories. Anyway, so basically, to cut a long story short, um, I met the men. I started off doing what I'd call my Hollywood submarine, which is exactly what you think a submarine sounded like. And <laughs> they just like laughed me out of the room. And then I spent a long time getting from them what the actual what actually happened on the submarine. It's lots and lots of rituals, because you know, basically because you don't want to leave the door open. That's ba the basic idea. <laughs> lots and lots of rituals. And a lot of them were sound based. And so basically I made each ritual into a little sort of pocket of like 10 seconds of sound. And then I made an algorithm that took those 10 seconds of sound and just sort of randomly made them happen. So you hear somebody going up and down a ladder and then at a random number of seconds, a random number of occurrences after that, he might say, uh, open the hatch door, please, or something like that. And we just sort of spoke about, if you like, not what did the submarine sound like, but what were the behaviours of you on the submarine? What did you do on the submarine? And so I built a sort of self-fulfilling piece that is based on the behaviours. And then sort of, hey, presto, you do that. You don't have to recreate the sound of the submarine. You collect the sounds that are associated with behaviours, moving a door, throwing the dice, saying certain things when a certain film came on, and you get the submarine. So that's sort of stage one. That's about sort of, sound know-how meets sort of curatorial know-how so this is this is what it sounds like this was the night before it opened so you can still see a few computers hanging about this is just me walking through with my friend alex with a mobile we just knackered we just opened the thing Anyway, well, you can listen to that online on YouTube. But, I mean, I was really touched because the submariners, they were very, very resistant to me working on there at first. But by the end of it, they sort of gave me a sort of submariner's badge and they said I was an honorary submariner. And actually one of them asked for some of the recordings so he could sleep with it under his pillow. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. We've got a lot um, of people in the chat who are also saying it's incredible as well. Um, and Liz asks... Um, where, what was the date that you did this work? Um, I can't remember. I've been 14, but I'm always going back because it's on a submarine. <laughs> they keep having sort of power outages that blow all the equipment. And then I have to go on and um, install, install replacements. But it's still there. It's, it's there in perpetuity. Well, until it breaks down again. Um, but this is, yeah. this is the interesting thing. Um, well, one of my things I found fascinating. Here we are. I've actually said it on the video, so I don't need to say it. <laughs> Can you read that? Or should I read it? The system, it also had set piece sound. So basically when the guides were going around, which were the submariners, they would say, and we used to do an emergency train uh, escape routine. And I went to this emergency escape tank and it was literally the most terrifying experience ever because you're, um, you are at the bottom of a tank with 300 meters of water above you. <laughs> and then they let it go and it just goes, like that and basically what they're doing is they're, they're teaching the men not to be this would have been in the sort of cold war era not to be panicked when they have to be emergency escape and what they do is they um let the water into the submarine they flood i can't even imagine they flooded it up to their necks and then in the little pocket of air they had left they take one last gasp and then they would whistle as they went up to the surface of the and they were like hundreds and hundreds of feet below water they'd whistle as they went up and um, this was how they escaped. But it was the sound of the emergency escape routine that got me. So here is the sound, which I put as a little special button that they can press if they're in. So 
playing. It's just a bit slow. Okay, plug in. They're plugging into their um, respirators ready to go. So you get a little bit of it on that, you get a big wash of it. But, but what was interesting about it for me on the day I went, because I didn't know what I was going to be doing. I didn't know what I was going to be doing the day that I went to this emergency escape tank, you know. And it was quite, you know, it was quite a culture shock working with a load of um, retired submariners. Although I have to say my grandfather, because of the Welsh connection, he was actually a submariner because he was a miner. A lot of the miners ended up as submariners in the Second World War. They've actually written a song about him called Submariner, funnily enough. And then it was really odd to be working on the submarines. Anyway, um, yes, so um, here's a thing. So I did this piece and the bit that got me after they did this absolutely astounding feat, which I just recorded and you know felt like I was in an inch of my life, was what happened when they'd finished, because of course it finishes and then you've had 300 feet of water drop past you and then you get this. I don't know if you can actually hear that. Oh, hang on. It's very, very quiet. And um, you can only just about hear that, but it was like, oh my God. And I just said, do you mind if I stay for a bit? And I, record, I spent ages recording these like drips, like the drips in Hades. I mean, I've never heard drips like them. And there's this English folk song that I've been wanting to set for ages called The Bows. And I won't go into the detail of it because you can read it up to another time or come see one of my shows. But The Bows is, um, it's a London folk song. So there's lots of different versions of it, but The Bows is the London version, the Bonnie Bows. And it's about a sororicide. So it's about uh, one sister pushes the other into the Thames to drown her. And her, the dead sister, her body floats along the Thames and gets picked up by a shepherd who takes it out of the water and finds her bones and turns them into a violin and, and the hair becomes the string of the violin. But when they take it to the king and play it, it can only play one song, and that's the Bonnie Bows of London. And as it plays, it says, you know, my sister pushed me in the water. And I thought, like, oh my God, I've got the raw materials for the Bonnie Bows. So that submarine experience became the Bonnie Bows, which became an album track. So it's a little bit of the Bonnie Bows. And I should say, key thing about this, the other element I needed. So I needed, I knew I kind of needed a violin that was sort of cracked in some way, which was quite handy because I'm a terrible violinist. So I just played the violin myself. And um, it also needed um, some drips, which I'd got. And then it just needed the undertow, which I just did with a great big, uh, I can't remember what I did it with. I think I did it with a synth actually. I can't remember, we'll find out. Yeah, I did it with an old synth. So it's a scratchy violin. Submarine. That's the same violin hitched right down. Just that one note. Is that loud enough? the bows which I perform a lot um, but of course performing doesn't pay the bills but theatre does and then I was asked to audition to do The Hairy Ape which if you don't know is a, it's a fantastic play by uh, Eugene O'Neill which is an expressionist film set on um, it's not about the shock of modernity and dehumanisation my two favourite subjects and uh, it's set, made, written in the 20s and it's set on a, in the sort of Stoke Holder steamship 
And I thought, well, I've got all, you know, it's like totally my area because I spent all this time in the submarine. And also um, I was able to recycle that violin sound for the one moment of sort of beauty in it, which is this sort of this speech. I wonder if I've even got this speech. Well, I can't remember the speech, but it's like Paddy. These men have sort of been this sort of brut brutalized situation. I don't know. And, and Paddy, the um, one man there, he suddenly says, oh, but I remember the, well, this play, he said, yes, but I remember the sailing ships and those fine men and would smell the sea and the salt and, you know, and it's just like, and I was able to sort of recycle those sounds. And so this is sort of happening all the time is that I'll get an idea and I'll sort of chew it around in different ways. And so sometimes it's a musical idea and sometimes it's a, um, an idea in um, a technique. Um, I'll just show you another technique. Uh, so here's an example. Right, this is interesting. I'm going to play you a Wren in the Cathedral. And the thing about a Wren in the Cathedral, I've got my theremin set up, but I'm slightly worried about the time. So maybe like, in a minute, I'll have a go at the theremin um, live. Should I, should, I, should I do that? Have we got time? I don't know what to do because we've got half an hour. Shall I? Um, Shall I show you the technique from sort of first principles and see if I can see if I can do that? So um, you're all familiar with the theremin, of course. Um, I don't know whether this is going to work over Zoom. I'm going to give it a whirl and see what happens. And if it doesn't, at least I tried. <laughs> OK, so I play the theremin. And the reason I play the theremin is because um, it's kind of I'm a sword player. So it's a very natural sort of oh, look at the wrong thing again. I'm looking at that piece, aren't I? Sorry about this, folks. I need to go into this. It's a total mess. Nobody ever gets to see this. This is my show patch as it's been totally transformed all the time by what I'm doing and getting messier and messier and messier. So, okay, yeah. so basically this is what I use. This is a patch that I've made for... Um, shows and I kind of do it in a modular way so like I'm doing a piece I chuck it in what I can't do is I can't show you what's inside there because if I do that I don't think you see do you? if I click on that you don't see that do you no okay no you don't okay so just look at the outside so what the, what I'm doing here is you all know what a theremin sounds like but I'll just in case you need a quick I, this, if this is too loud I apologize we haven't actually so can you actually even see my theremin no kind of yet yeah. so um yeah, I can't play in this environment because I'm way too close to it. There's way too much reverb on this theremin, and it's not set up properly at all. But you know, oh, I can't play. Do you know why I can't play? Because there's a like a quarter second or fifth second delay, and I can't play because I'm hearing it on delay. Oh, that's really weird. So I have, because I can't react. Yeah, you get the idea. Anyway, that's the theremin, which, which you absolutely cannot play, it turns out, on uh, Zoom. Um, but one of the things that I like to do is use the theremin classically, but also use it to control other sounds. So what I've done, if you look at this patch here, can you see my cursor? Can you see the yellow blob in the patch? Is that showing right now? Yeah, if you look, that is a spectrum of what... So I made a little set up thing in Max to do a spectrum of what I'm doing. Um, so even when the theremin's off, I hope that that's find out. Yeah. Oh, now what's that playing? Hang on. Oh, this is so confusing. I'm going to turn the live theremin off. Nope. Excuse me. I literally have no idea why we're hearing that. Oh, I know. Can you hear that? Was it just me? I actually don't know what's going on. We've got some. I don't think I can show this. I can't actually show this because of Zoom is just doing my. Oh. That's it, it's gone now. Okay, right. Okay, right. So you see that see that um yellow thing? That's the spectrum. So as you see, as I move up and down, you 
to see a remote flip from going under. I'm doing this very crudely because you can't do this um, over Zoom because of the delay. It drives you back. Okay, so you've got that. And then what's going on underneath is I'm using the, I've done some maths in that box that says Space Willow, which I can't reveal to you because it won't let me show it to you right now. And that turns the pitch, which I'm tracking in real time, into a speed. So you can see that's high speed, that's low speed, high speed, low speed, and everything in between. And then what I do, now this is really, really crude today because of the setup, so I can't do it with any finesse, but I'm just going to give you the idea. It's going to be a zero finesse version of my usual thing. As I say, I, I started off doing things really figuratively, and in the same way, I started off doing these effects with that really kind of, how do I describe it? Samples from old films that are a bit too, what I'd say, a bit too on the nose. But here's an example. So now, instead of using playing a theremin, what I'm doing now, you can't hear because I've got it off, is I'm playing a sample from an old film and I'm going to use the pitch of the theremin to control the speed of the sample. This is going to sound complete pants today because I'm not hearing it, I'm hearing it on delay, so I don't know where to move my hand in time, if that makes sense. Oh. I can't hear that, can you? No. Hang on. Nothing to try. If this doesn't work, sort of uh, instant gratification. Oh, you know what's happened? It's crashing. It doesn't like the Zoom. Oh, doesn't like Zoom. Hang on, let me stop the share for a sec. As well as playing classic theremin, uh, what you'd expect to hear when you see a theremin player on stage, I use the theremin live to control other samples, to scrub them, um, swoop their speed up and down. I've created a max patch to do that, and here's an excerpt from it. I'm playing the theremin into this max patch, but not letting you hear the theremin itself. So the theremin is being used as a silent sonic control signal. The green shapes in the white box show the spectrum of the sound from the theremin. Now I'm lowering the pitch of the theremin. Now I'm raising it. and now I'm varying the volume of the theremin. I'm also measuring pitch and volume numerically in a sub patch, and I'm using pitch and a bit of maths to create something called the playback speed, and that's gonna be the playback speed of another sample, the thing I want to control. Now you can't hear anything yet because the sample I've got is silent, but now I'm gonna switch another sample on. The science of causing change to occur by means of one's will. In magic, there is neither good nor evil. It is merely a science. The science of causing change to occur by means of one's will. When I first stepped out with this effect around 2004, I was always using effects like that that really showed it off. You know, things like hypnosis sequences from old horror films, but they're a little bit too on the nose. And now I tend to use it with samples that leave a little more room for the listener's imagination. That was actually Blackbird song I was manipulating and I loved how with the theremin I could sculpt the pitch contour of the Blackbird and make it sound like another bird entirely. 
and I used this effect when I wanted an otherworldly and indefinable swooping bird in a piece I made a few years ago called A Wren in the Cathedral. You can find the whole thing on YouTube, but here's a clip. The other performer in that video, apart from Hugo, was percussionist Stephen Hiscock. A lot of my work that doesn't use the theremin still concerns itself with unusual manipulations of speed and pitch. Here's another example, which I originally made for a piece called You Taught Me How to See the Crows. When I send a sound into this patch, it records it. Now, every time I press one of these brown buttons, it tells the patch to grab the sound from the point at which the button was pressed. And when I click on the blue square, just to the left of the button, it then plays back the sound. So you've got four separate buttons for grabbing and four separate buttons for playback. might just seem like a four channel loop pedal but there's another element at work because each of the four channels can play back at their own speed and independently their own pitch and that means things tend to sort of catch up with each other when you're not expecting it you get all sorts of renaissance style collisions and that's very much the effect I was after, where unexpected harmony arises when very simple melodies collide. When you get into stretching sound in time, you soon discover it's all in the detail because there are lots of stretching algorithms and some leave the sound really fizzy and ugly and some are a lot kinder. And I have sort of different algorithms that I'd use for different instruments. And I mean, you've really just got to experiment, but Max has quite a few good ones. And of course the ones in Ableton are pretty good as well. And I like the algorithm I've settled on because it works really well with extreme stretches. I mean, we're talking like 64, 128 time stretching.
I used these stretching techniques on voices in the score I created for the horror film Amulet. Amulet was written and directed by Romola Garay and it made it to Sundance in January 2020. And then very sadly, because of the COVID pandemic, it hasn't actually made it to the UK yet. But I can play you a few samples from my score. Um, the opening cue is a simple melody that gets repeated over and over. And every time it gets repeated, um, it's getting stretched a little bit more. bass note drops at the reveal of a forest where something happens that haunts Thomas, one of the main protagonists, all the way through the film. And every time this disturbance happens, I bring back the female voices. And every time I bring them back, I've stretched them radically, 32, 64, 128 times. So you get to the point where you're hearing all the details of the plosives and all the spit in their mouths so they feel humanistic but otherworldly but voices that have a family resemblance to something you've heard before Those cues were sung by Sarah Gabriel. Here's another cue sung by Melanie Pappenheim. And this is for a love scene with a very nasty supernatural sting at the end of it. found some of these ideas of interest and that you enjoyed the music including the film and that you'll look out for the film Amulet when it finally surfaces in the UK post Covid. Thanks so much to everybody at Yorkshire Sound Women's Network for making me so welcome and for holding the fort when the Zoom failed hence this rather strange add-on after the event. If any of you have any questions or comments 
feel free to send them along. And I'm going to end by playing a bit of vengeant female music from the climax 